Dear friends, welcome to my channel where we dive into the fascinating world of ancient Greek philosophy and self-improvement, specifically Stoicism. In this video, we will be exploring the principles and teachings of Stoicism, a school of thought that has stood the test of time for over two millennia. Join me as we uncover the wisdom of ancient Stoic philosophers such as Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius, and learn how their teachings can help us face the challenges of modern life and achieve self-improvement. Subscribe to my channel to learn more about Stoicism and other philosophical topics. Don't forget to like, comment, and share this video with your friends who are interested in philosophy. Stay tuned for more news about Stoicism and beyond. Let's go on this journey of self-discovery and personal growth together. Enjoy watching. Practicing self-improvement. Learning to grow up correctly. Advice from Seneca. Let's meet old age with open arms. After all, it is full of pleasures, if you know how to use it. Fruit for us tastes best when they are running out. Children are most beautiful when the end of childhood. Lovers of drink is the sweetest of all the last cup, from which they go to the bottom, which completes the intoxication. Every pleasure saves its sweetest moment for the end, and the most pleasant age is the one that goes downhill but not yet into the abyss. And the one that stands at the last line, I think, is not deprived of its pleasures, or all the pleasures are replaced by the lack of need for them. It is one thing to think of a tiger, and quite another to meet one, says an ancient Chinese wisdom. The Chinese are right, because no matter how vivid the imaginary pictures may be, they can't compare to reality. No matter how convincing your negative visualization may be, life will puzzle you more. There are no exceptions to this rule, believe me. Stoics recommend to think about old age when you are young in order to be more happy today when you are healthy or relatively healthy and full of energy. Imagined, rejoiced, live on. Let's be honest, few people are inclined to negative visualization when they are young and peace of mind is not perceived as a value at a young age. There are so many things around, so many fascinating temptations, so many pleasures. You want to try everything. You want to enjoy life to the fullest instead of thinking about old age. The Stoics' advice to live for today is understood by young people as don't think about the future, although what is really meant is that one should enjoy the present moment and put off as few things as possible for the future. Time is fleeting. Everything is finite. Youth is fleeting. How long does it last? At best, a decade and a half from 15 to 30. By best case, it means that a person will feel young until the age of 30. Some people say goodbye to youth already in their 20s. Then comes the time of full blossoming of strength, when one does not want to think about old age either, because there are so many things to do around. And in general, the gurus of positivism teach us never to think about bad things in order not to attract them to us. Where do such wise men come from? But time is treacherous and life is harsh. Already in the fourth decade, a person can meet with the so-called midlife crisis, a long-term and uncomfortable emotional state caused by a reassessment of life experience and the feeling that youth has long passed and old age is near. The person becomes depressed, feels inner desolation and self-pity. He feels himself a victim of unjust circumstances that have driven him to a deed end from which there is no way out. Former values, career, creative achievements, marital relationships, etc. are devalued. Life is ruined. Devalued. Life at once loses both purpose and meaning. And all this happens against the background of the beginning of a ging of the body. Muscles and skin lose their elasticity, wrinkles appear, obesity can develop, 
and so on, continued the list of horrors yourself if you want to. Of course, psychologists and doctors will not leave a person alone with such a significant problem, and they will not leave themselves without income. There are a great many practices that help to overcome this crisis, but it would be better to avoid it altogether, wouldn't it? That's impossible, many readers may say now. Forgive generously, but in the genes of a person is not written in the program of the midlife crisis. In any case, scientists have not discovered it yet, so let us assume that it does not exist. Tell me, please, which person is more likely to have a successful meeting with a tiger? The one who walks through the taiga without fear and without looking back, holding a camera in his hands? Or the one who is always on the alert and holds a loaded carbine of some wall-crushing caliber? Of course, the second one. He will either shoot the tiger or scare him with a shot so that the tiger will run away. And the first one, at best, will have to run away from the tiger. And at this moment, it is absolutely useless to think about the fact that you should have kept your ears to the ground and brought a gun with you because you should treat the past, as you already know, fatalistically. If you know that you are going on the train, Moscow, Vladivostok, you will not be surprised, puzzled, or frightened by the fact that you are at the station of Tiumen, right? But if you fall asleep in your Moscow apartment and wake up on the bench of the Tiumen station, then your anxiety will not be limited. But enough of our examples. Let's get back to the midlife crisis. If you have been thinking about old age since the age of 20, the figure is conditional. Within the framework of the Stoic practice of negative visualization, if you understand, i.e., realize and accept that youth will be replaced by maturity, and maturity by old age, then how can you be puzzled and saddened by the achievement of middle age? When you reach it, you will be glad that you have lived to this day. Among your acquaintances, there will certainly be those who died younger, and if not, you can remember Lermontov or Essenin and that the mistakes and disappointments of youth are behind you. You can say to yourself, even if I am not so quick, but I have accumulated a lot of life experience and still have a lot of powder in my powders. And of course, you will take measures that will help you to slow down aging as much as possible. Take up sports. If you have not done so before, choose a system of intellectual training, normalize your diet, etc. And with all of this, you will be calm, and your calmness will allow you to create the right strategy to slow aging. Staying in a state of anxiety, you can't create anything good. It's axiomatic. The cessation of activity, the suspension of striving and the ability to persuade, and death in general are by no means yet evil, writes Marcus Aurelius. Think only of the ages, such as childhood, youth, youth, old age. After all, in them every change is death. But is all this scary? Think further of your life at work, then at your mother's and at your father's, and everywhere encountering all kinds of differences, changes and terminations, ask yourself, is all this scary? But then neither is the cessation, suspension, and change of all life terrible. Look around you, talk to your acquaintances who have passed the half-century mark, and you will certainly find a few people who have not had a midlife crisis. The author of this book also knows about midlife crisis only by hearsay. Why are they so fortunate? For the fact that they know how to accept life as it is, are not inclined to lament the lost and are not afraid of the future. What is to be feared is what is avoidable such as heart failure caused by severe obesity. Eat in moderation, do not abuse high-calorie foods, and your motor will work well. But what good is it to fear the inevitable, which will come regardless of your will? Worrying about the inevitable will not prepare you for it, but will only spoil you today. Forewarned is forearmed. Who will try, even in youth, to take care of getting the right education, writes Musonius, well study all those lessons that are considered appropriate and sufficiently test them in practice and in old age, using these own preparations, 
will live according to nature. Without sadness, will suffer the loss of the pleasures of youth. Without regret, will meet bodily weakness. Will not be dissatisfied if he will be neglected by neighbors, or if he cease to care for his relatives and friends. For against all these things, he will have an excellent remedy in his own mind, the training he has received. If you give yourself the trouble to realize, feel, and accept that you are moving from childhood to old age, the inevitable end of which will be death, your midlife crisis will have nothing to grow on. But what do you do if you've caught on too late and the ruthless hand of the crisis is already knocking on your door? Do not let in, that is, try to pretend that nothing bad is happening to you. I'm happy. I'm successful, I'm doing well, and it will always be like this. Don't be naive. The crisis, once it has come, will easily knock down any door. It is impossible to hide from it. But you can drive it away, though. It will be much more difficult than to prevent it from appearing in your life and a certain trauma it will have time to cause you. But better a little damage than a lot, right? If someone who had an initial stock of knowledge was worse, writes Musonius, but then he was more attentive to good advice and showed the ability to follow them, that too undoubtedly will be prosperous. He will try to listen to the persuasive words of those who have made it their business to know what is harmful and what is useful to people, by which way the first should be avoided and the second to acquire, and how you can calmly accept that falls out to a person that seems to be evil, but it is not. How to pay off a midlife crisis with little blood using the experience of Stoicism. The great philosopher Plato, 5th, 4th centuries BC, a student of Socrates and teacher of Aristotle, begins his famous treatise, The State, with a conversation about old age between Socrates and a certain elder named Cephalus. Socrates asks if old age is difficult. Cephalus answers thus, in our assemblies, we speak of old men, many lament the pleasures of their youth, the memories of love affairs, drunkenness, feasting, and other amusements of the same kind, and they are grouchy, as if they had lost something great, as if in those days they had lived beautifully, and now they do not live at all. And some are also offended by the fact that their old age is exposed to the ridicule of their neighbors and therefore they sing the same song of complaint about it as the cause of all their evils. But in my opinion, Socrates in this way, they do not get at the cause. If old age were really the cause, I would suffer the same things from it as all others who have reached the same age. On the contrary, I have already happened to meet others, not such old people, and Sophocles. Once someone asked the poet Sophocles, What are you now, Sophocles, in relation to the pleasures of love? Can you still have a relationship with a woman? And he answered, Speak better, good man. I left it with the greatest joy, as one flees from a mad and cruel master. Such an answer seemed good to me then, and I like it no less now. Indeed, old age, as regards such things, is a time of perfect peace and freedom. When the passions cease to be vexed and weaken, then is precisely the state of Sophocles, a state of liberation from many and furious masters. The cause of both this Socrates and of domestic troubles is one. Not old age, but human temper. If old men are valiant and of easy disposition, then old age is tolerable for them. And when they are not, both old age and youth, Socrates, are equally obnoxious to them. Everything leads us to the same rule of Stoicism. The qualitative assessment of all things depends on us, on our attitude to them. Aged Seneca rejoiced that the oppression of age is felt only by his body, and his soul is cheerful and happy that it almost does not have to deal with the flesh. What is there to be happy about, you may wonder. Rejoice in what you have 
and rejoice in what you have, Seneca would reply, and Marcus Aurelius would add, wherever I am, I can be happy. The path of Stoicism, on the one hand, looks extremely simple because following it, we have to internalize well-understood postulates with which each of us deeply agree. On the other hand, this way is incredibly difficult because it is not enough only to know the postulates. You have to accept them, to make them a part of your worldview, and you have to follow them according to the will of your mind and the call of your heart, and not by compulsion. That's all. That's all. Everything has its time, and you cannot endlessly postpone endlessly late. If at the beginning of the midlife crisis you can still change a lot of things, then, in 70 years, to change your attitude to old age, you are unlikely to succeed. Theoretically, you can take the path of truth at any age, and as we know, it is better late than never. But we are pragmatic practitioners who are not inclined to be seduced and look at the world through rose-colored glasses, right? So we understand everything correctly. Yes, the book you are holding in your hands can be useful at the age of 70 or 80, but the later you take the path of stoicism, the path of self-improvement, the path to happiness, the path of harmonious life, the less you will be able to achieve. Success is having time. Here is a topic for scientific research. Can a person of age be happier than a young person? Take 18 to 25 years old and 75, 85 years old as the conventional age boundaries. There should be at least five participants in each group and preferably 10 or 20. The participants of the experiment should be chosen at random, roughly speaking, by the method of Polk. The result can be formalized in any way you like, at least in the form of a table or in the form of a literary essay. Before starting the research, develop a scale on which you will evaluate happiness. 5 point, 10 point, 12 point, in short, whatever you want. Are you daring? Go ahead, it's a very useful study. You may not win a Nobel Prize for it, though who knows, but you will benefit from it. In the stormy sea of people and events, without sparing your belly, you will make a lot of discoveries, sometimes without wanting to. In all circumstances, the soul should turn from everything external to itself. Let it hope in itself, rejoice in itself, contemplate its own. Let it not feel the loss and even unfavorable takes indulgently. As stated in Seneca's treatise on the serenity of the spirit. Ah, as an example of this universal recommendation, Seneca recalls the stoic Julius Canis, a man of extraordinary greatness who dared to argue with Emperor Caligula. When an angry Caligula ordered Cana's execution, he thanked him for it and calmly awaited execution for 10 days. Seneca ponders what exactly did Khan mean when he thanked the emperor for the death sentence. Did he want to express his resentment in this way? Did he want to show how great Caligula's cruelty is, if even death is a favor to his subjects? Was it perhaps a veiled censure of the mad tyrant? Or did Khan accept death as freedom? But one thing is certain. The expression of gratitude was not a sly attempt to avoid a terrible fate because Caligula did not overturn his sentences. He, Khan, was playing pebbles when the centurion, leading the crowd of those doomed to be executed, ordered him to gather as well, writes Seneca. Then he counted pebbles and said to his comrade, Look, as if after my death you do not begin to make up that you won. And then, turning to the centurion, he added, You will be witness that I have one pebble more. Do you suppose Khan was really busy playing? He was mocking. To his friends, grieving over their impending separation, Khan asked, Why are you sad? You are trying to find out whether souls are immortal, and I am about to find out. The philosopher who accompanied Khan to the place of execution 
said that he intended to find out whether the soul would feel its departure and promised to share the knowledge with his friends. Ancient Romans and Greeks believed that the spirit of the deceased or his shadow could visit living people and communicate with them. Undoubtedly, Khan's courage is a rare phenomenon and is not available to every person, but we all need to have a perfect role model in front of our eyes and strive to resemble him as much as possible. Summary. Think about your future, about the fact that someday old age will come to you, followed by death. Understand the inevitability of what is happening. Try to keep the good things as long as possible, but do not be upset when you have to part with them. And here is one last universal advice from Seneca. You cannot constantly load the mind with work because it will lead to lethargy and some dullness. The time to do business is the hour to be done. Do not forget about rest because an appropriate and moderate entertainment is nothing wrong. But everything is good in moderation. For example, sleep is necessary for us to rest but if it lasts indefinitely, it will turn into death. The second practice of self-improvement, learning to use time rationally. Advice from Seneca. No one can take a single day from me without being able to compensate adequately for such a loss. Time is not money. Time is the greatest value we possess. Time should be spent usefully. These words should not be understood as a call to do things all the time. At the end of the previous chapter, the need for rest was mentioned. If you have fun or even idleness in order to give rest to your mind and body, such a waste of time will be considered useful. It is only necessary to be able to distinguish between necessary rest and idleness. The basis of rational use of time is a clear setting of goals to which you are striving. When a ship does not know to which port it is heading, no wind will be a tailwind, says Seneca. Aimless means useless. If you have little or no idea of the purpose of your actions, you are wasting your time. In every matter, consider the premises and consequences and then proceed to it. Epictetus teaches. Otherwise, at first you will undertake it with zeal, because you have not thought through any of the consequences, and then, when some of them become clear, you will retreat in shame. I want to win the Olympics. But you consider the prerequisites of this and the consequences, and then, if it is expedient for you, you take up the cause. You must obey a strict order, observe a compulsory diet, Abstain from cookies, exercise necessarily at fixed times, in heat, in cold, do not drink cold water, do not drink wine whenever you can. In a word, place yourself at the disposal of your mentor as at the disposal of a doctor. Then, during the fight, you may be pushed into a ditch, you may dislocate your arm, twist your leg, swallow sand, be chiseled, and after all this, you may be defeated. When you have thought all this through, and if you still want to, then enter the field of athletes. Otherwise, look, you will behave like children who play athletes, gladiators, trumpet, then present a tragedy, acting out whatever they see and whatever strikes them. And so you, then an athlete, then a gladiator, then a philosopher, then an orator, and with all your soul, nothing but, like a monkey, imitate everything you see, and forever you like one thing after another, and the habitual ceases to like. You have started to this or that without consideration, and not having analyzed the whole case, and without checking but rashly and on an empty desire. Each of us has individual peculiarities that favor certain activities and serve as an obstacle to others. When setting a goal for himself, a person must first assess his nature and realize whether he is up to the task. A philosopher first needs a sharp mind and a tendency to think, while a wrestler needs strength, agility, and endurance. 
There is only one goal available to all people without exception. It is virtue. The pursuit of virtue is a prerequisite for a properly organized life. In every speech one should pay attention to what is said, in every endeavor to what comes out of it, Marcus Aurelius advises. In the first case it is necessary to keep an eye on the meaning, in the second one should first of all look at the goal pursued. First, one should not act in vain and without purpose. Secondly, one should consider only one goal, the common good, and nothing else. Here it should be clarified that, speaking of common good, the Stoic Emperor did not mean working for the good of society as the only possible one, but that all the goals set should not be to the detriment of society. Wanting to become an outstanding economist is worthy and commendable, because by achieving your goal, you will do much good for society. It is unworthy to plan a bank robbery, because you will enrich yourself at the expense of other people. And do not remember that all banks are insured against criminal encroachments, because in the end someone else will have to compensate for what you have stolen. Nowadays, there are a great many practices that help you learn how to manage your time. But it often happens that, diligently performing the tasks, practitioners forget about the main thing, that the goals should be formulated very clearly and clearly, as well as that our desires should always correspond to our capabilities. And what to do if there's no way to clearly assess one's capabilities? Pardon the author's clumsy pun. Let's imagine, for example, that you decided to take part in a triathlon competition where you will be required to swim about four kilometers, ride a bicycle 180 kilometers, and run 42 kilometers. You've been practicing sports since you were a child. You're in good health and you feel you have the necessary strength, but at the same time you have a worm of doubt inside you. Will I be able to do it? Let's take another example. You want to become commercial director of the firm where you are still working as a sales manager. You have the necessary education, you have experience, and you are well regarded by your superiors. You seem to have a chance to get the coveted position, but deep down you doubt, will it work? What to do in such a situation? To lower the bar, to offend yourself, and what if it would have been possible to achieve the desired, because you had certain reasons for it? Striving for a knowingly unattainable goal means to offend yourself even more. Time, energy, and money will be wasted, and as a compensation, you will get disappointment and anxiety. Throw a coin or read the cards. In principle, no one forbids you to do this. Moreover, the ancient Stoics, who relied on reason, to fortune-telling and predictions, had a positive attitude. Seneca believed that the sequence of fates everywhere sends forward indications of future events, and everything that happens serves as a sign of some future events. But at the same time, he specified that one can foresee only that in which there is order, and the random and disorderly is unpredictable. Well, let it be so, but in our enlightened times it is hardly rational to rely on fortune-telling. Whether it rains or snows, whether it will or not, is not our method. So don't dare. Dare? We must dare! I'll bet you do. In such an uncertain situation, when you doubt your abilities, it helps to set intermediate goals that are easier and faster to achieve than the main goal. In the case of a triathlon, this would be participating in individual events with shorter distances, half or quarters. In the case of a career, it would be obtaining a position as head of sales. By achieving an intermediate goal, you will be able to better assess your capabilities and your chances for further advancement along your chosen path. Even if you realize that the big triathlon or the position of commercial director you cannot do, you will not be disappointed, because you have achieved something, and something is always better than nothing. Again, moving toward a goal contributes to personal development. 
Marcus Aurelius advises not to give in to flights of fancy, not to indulge in excessive despair or exultation, and not to fill a lifetime with doing things. The life of a wise Stoic should not be like an endless run, but it should not be like trampling on one place. Having set a goal, it is necessary to move towards it confidently. Confidence allows to reach the goal sooner, i.e., saves time. However, according to wise philosophers, being confident does not mean not being cautious. Where independent of free will, there let you have bold confidence, and where dependent on free will, there prudence, Epictetus asks. For if the evil consists in the unfortunate free will, then only to all this should be treated with prudence, and if everything independent of free will and independent of us has nothing to do with us, then to all this should be treated with bold confidence. Through a prudent attitude toward all that is truly evil, we will have a boldly confident attitude toward all that is not so. Of course, Epictetus does not consider free will to be evil. He implies that evil can come from man, from his will, and therefore advises prudence in actions that depend on us, dictated by our reason. Let us make a small digression from the current topic in order to add to the previous chapter the words of Epictetus about death, said in the framework of the combination of certainty and prudence. It would be necessary that in relation to death, there should be bold certainty, and in relation to the fear of death, prudence. But in reality, it is the opposite. In relation to death, flight, and in relation to the opinion of it, inattention, carelessness, indifference. Everything you do should be endeavored to do as well as possible. If to do, then to do well, says one of the Stoic rules. One should be serviceable, not fixable, says Marcus Aurelius, referring to the qualities of man. But these words can be fully applied to our deeds as well. By avoiding redoing what we've done, we save a lot of time. You can do a simple experiment. For one or two months, write down how much time it took you to redo things. If the total tends to zero, that's just great. You can consider yourself a perfect person, worthy of all respect. If the total turns out to be frighteningly large, all the better, because you will get another opportunity for self-improvement and nothing can be better than this activity. Does the advice not to postpone for tomorrow what can be done today need any comments? Stoicism teaches us to regard every day as our last, but at the same time we should do things without haste because haste is a bad helper. We must realize that the call to live today does not exempt us from planning our actions. Planning, without which it is impossible to use time rationally, is completely within the framework of Stoicism, although Seneca has one very interesting passage on this subject. Is there anyone in the world more foolish than people who boast of their wise foresight? Asks Seneca. They are forever busy and preoccupied beyond measure. How, at the expense of their lives, they arrange their lives to be better. They make far-reaching plans and, after all, to put something off for the future, the worst way to squander life. Every coming day is taken away from you. You give up the present in exchange for the promise of the future. Waiting is the main hindrance of life. It is eternally dependent on tomorrow and ruins today. You try to dispose of what is still in fortune's hands, letting go of what was in your own. Where are you looking? Where are you stretching your hands? The future is unknown. Live now. What can be said to this? Of course, foresight is useful, since it is one of the facets of prudence that Epictetus in particular calls for. Useful plans can also be far-reaching. It is often impossible to do without such plans. So, for example, a teenager who has decided to become a doctor cardiologist, even at school should lay on biology, chemistry and physics, because the results of these subjects are taken into account when entering medical school. 
After six years of study at the university, it is necessary to pass a two-year clinical residency in cardiology. Six plus two is eight, and the necessary subjects should be emphasized from the eighth to ninth grade, no later. Thus, the plan to become a cardiologist stretches for 11 to 12 years, about the same way the purchase of an apartment on credit stretches for a long time. A person calculates his possibilities for many years ahead and decides that he will be able to pay for the apartment after a certain number of years. So Seneca was wrong. Not exactly. He criticized those who postponed things for the future, but he did not express himself very clearly. Ancient authors in general have a lot of conditional fog. You often have to read, not read, but read, trying to figure out what they meant. Seneca could think that the meaning of what he said was clear to everyone and do without clarification. It may be recalled that Seneca was a mentor and advisor to the young emperor Nero. It is impossible to teach a pupil without some kind of plan, and in the same way it is impossible to deal with the affairs of government without planning. If you encounter an insurmountable obstacle in your path, you need to... Most of today's motivational blabbermouth speakers will say, you need to remove that obstacle because nothing impossible or insurmountable exists. Doesn't exist. If you find yourself in China, try to climb over the Great Wall of China amateurishly and time the time it takes you to realize the utter futility of this activity. But that's just a joke. But seriously, when you encounter an insurmountable obstacle that suddenly appears on your path, you should first follow the advice of Marcus Aurelius. Remove the belief, and the complaint of harm will be removed. Remove the complaint of harm, and the harm itself will be removed. If changing your attitude to what is happening does not work, and this is quite possible in some cases, then reconsider your goal and change your strategy, seeing nothing wrong or shameful in this. What can be shameful in a realistic and adequate assessment of events? Let's say that a month before a triathlon competition, a potential competitor was in a car accident and suffered a broken leg. No matter what he does, he won't be able to compete. Or, for example, your company has a new employee who surpasses you from all sides, experience, achievements, and regalia, and on top of that is married to the CEO's daughter. You will not be able to take over the position of commercial director from such a bison. In vain to flounder, only wasting time. There is only one way out, to revise your goal and change the conditions of its achievement with the least losses for yourself. The experience gained during wasted training will allow you to better prepare for competitions next year. And the experience gained during work may come in handy in another company, where there will be no insurmountable obstacles in your way. You won't waste time overcoming the insurmountable or give up on your goal, but simply change your plan and your strategy to make the most of what you've already achieved. In all cases of life, be guided by two rules, advises Marcus Aurelius. First, do only what reason inspires. This is the dominant part of your being, which directs actions for the benefit of people. Secondly, be able to change your mind if someone points out your mistake or manages to change your mind. But change your opinion only in accordance with justice, common benefit, and the like, not because the new view seems easier, more pleasant, or promises fame. Let us expand this useful advice to be able to change your mind if circumstances require it, for on the one hand we plan, and on the other hand we live for today without making a cult of our plans and realizing that at any moment external circumstances may change in the most unexpected way. The mind helps us to realize what is promising and what is not, and guides us along a promising path so that we spend our time usefully.
No, it is not little time we have, but much we lose, Seneca writes in his treatise on the transience of life. Life is given to us long enough, and it is abundant enough to accomplish the greatest deeds if you distribute it wisely. But if it is not guided by a good purpose, if our wastefulness and carelessness allow it to flow between our fingers, then, when our last hour strikes, we are surprised to find that the life, the flow of which we did not notice, has expired. That's right. We didn't get a short life. We made it short. Reasoning on the Stoics' Egoism Talking about whether the Stoics are the kind of hardened egoists they seem at first glance is best done in the middle of an introduction to the practices of Stoicism. You already know a lot and have a fairly broad idea of this art of life, but it is unlikely that you have yet had time to be disappointed in it because of the inherent great egoism. Are not the Stoics selfish? The very real ones. They consider themselves the poopies of the earth, think only of themselves and their feelings, and in addition openly admit that the death of a loved one should not upset the advanced Stoic. The fact that they regularly imagine that their loved ones are dead is nothing to talk about. It is the height of egoism and cynicism. We are, of course, exaggerating and going a bit overboard in the direction of exaggeration, but comparisons of Stoicism with egoism are commonplace. We can say that there is no modern Stoic who has not, at some point, thought that the path of Stoicism coincides with the path of egoism. Who is an egoist? It is a person obsessed with his own gain. The egoist prefaces every action he takes with the question, what will I get out of this? The same thing is taught by the great Stoics of antiquity. Epictetus in his discourses reminds us that if piety and benefit are not combined, piety cannot be preserved in anyone. How's that feel, eh? And Seneca in his treatise on providence goes so far as to say that even disasters such as exile, poverty, loss of children and wife, shame or illness are good for a person. Only an egoist can speak of benefit for himself in case of death of a loved one, can't he? Marcus Aurelius was not inclined to verbosity and therefore expressed himself very succinctly, saying that benefit forces nature to act in one way or another. Everything that is done by man must benefit him. No one is tired of being benefited, writes the Stoic Emperor. Benefit, however, is associated with acting in harmony with nature. Do not grow weary of receiving benefit by doing it. Evaluate the last phrase and the motive for the allegedly altruistic activities of the Stoics for the good of society will become clear to you. They try not so much for the sake of those around them as for themselves. Have I done anything for the common good? Asks Marcus Aurelius and immediately answers, then I have benefited myself. Stoics want to feel virtuous because it gives them satisfaction. But what if it didn't? We can look at the problem from the other side asking, maybe there is nothing wrong with egoism if we use it correctly. Still, Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius were decent people. In any case, this is the impression that emerges from the testimonies of their contemporaries. We can assume that the efforts for the sake of public benefit were just a clever trick, a clever PR move, as it is commonly expressed nowadays. And why not? The founders of Stoicism and those who developed it, like Epictetus, needed to make their teachings attractive. Seneca, imperial mentor, advisor, and senator, needed Stoicism to create a certain image, just as Marcus Aurelius did. Rarely would an egotist risk publicly admitting his egotism, incurring the disapproval of all. Better to wear the mask of the virtuous altruist. And please don't bring up Marcus Aurelius selling off his wife's palace property and jewelry. We don't know what the situation in Rome was at the time. Perhaps the new taxes would lead to a revolt, and Marcus Aurelius was well aware of this. 
An intelligent ruler would not drive his subjects to extremes. He would rather sell off his property. This is the end of the speech denouncing the Stoics in selfishness. If you wish, you can add something of your own, a thought or a quote, but the whole picture is already clear. Stoics are unconditional egoists, and forgive the author if he upset anyone by studying this fact. People whose behavior is entirely determined by utility, by definition, cannot help but be selfish. The prosecution has spoken. Let's turn the floor over to the defense. For the statement, all Stoics are egoists, to be true, the very important word reasonable must be inserted. All Stoics are reasonable egoists. However, they were not familiar with this notion. It appeared only in the New Age. How does a reasonable egoist differ from an unreasonable one? And is there no wordplay here which does not clarify anything but only makes things foggy? To put it simply, an egoist is guided by his own interests without taking into account the interests of other people, and a reasonable egoist lives by his own interests but does not infringe on other people's interests. Reasonable egoists live according to the golden rule of morality, which calls for not doing to another what you do not want to do to yourself. A rational, objective, and virtuous person is doomed to be a rational egoist because this is the only true concept of reasonable interaction with society. If everyone around me feels good, it makes me feel good, so I should strive to make everyone around me feel good. Is this reasonable? Definitely reasonable. If you want to get acquainted with the concept of reasonable egoism, you can turn to Nikolai Chernyshevsky's novel, What is to be Done?, in which the reasonable egoist Lopukhov appears. Under socialism, this work, admittedly quite boring and devoid of artistic merit, was included in the school curriculum because of its revolutionary orientation and the high evaluation given to it by Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin. But if you do not want to wade through a very heavy syllable of the author, you can limit yourself to familiarizing yourself with this passage, cleared of verbal husks. You see, my dear perceptive reader, what cunning noble people are, and how selfishness plays in them, because they find their highest pleasure in making people whom they respect think of them as noble people, and for this purpose, they bother and invent all sorts of things, no less assiduously than you do for your own purposes. Only your purposes are different, therefore you and they invent different things. You invent trashy things, harmful to others, and they invent honest things, useful to others. But isn't that what religion, such as Christianity, teaches us? No, not really. Christianity is based on love of neighbor, and Stoicism is based on rationality of actions. A true Christian does not do evil to his neighbors because he loves them, and a true Stoic does not do evil because it would disturb his peace of mind and would not bring him moral satisfaction. We can put it another way. A Christian helps his neighbor out of the dictates of his soul, and a Stoic helps his neighbor because in this way he helps himself. But the bottom line in both cases is the same. Do good to others for their benefit. The selfishness of the Stoics is more of a pragmatism. Whatever the Stoics do, they end up trying for their own peace of mind, that is, for their own benefit. But is this a bad thing? Is it wrong to strive to ensure that the world around you lives according to the same reasonable laws as yourself? The concentration of the Stoics on themselves, their feelings and their thoughts is absolutely justified because we are able to fully control only our own thoughts and actions, and thoughts are not always. We can persuade others by our example, and we can also try to influence them unobtrusively or, in extreme cases, to punish them. But we cannot control other people. So what is the point of worrying about their behavior? We do worry most of the time, but it does little good. Stoicism teaches us to withdraw into ourselves in order to control and, if necessary, 
change what we are actually capable of controlling and changing. In this way, we save time and don't waste our energies. There is no selfishness in recognizing that we are only free over our own actions. One might even see it as caring for one's neighbors, since self-absorbed Stoics try not to bother those around them. Is that a bad thing? If we all followed this rule and did not annoy each other at all, our planet would have long ago reached a golden age of universal bliss. Look around you. Are there people among your acquaintances who are eager to help their neighbors with advice or deeds? Obviously, there will be such people, and most of them will cause dissatisfaction rather than gratitude. It is necessary to help our neighbor with intelligence, tact, and discernment so that the help does not turn into evil. What is especially good Stoics from the point of view of others? These inveterate egoists are never obsessive and do not try to arrange the lives of others according to their own measure. Not because they are lazy or reluctant, but because they realize that everyone can and should be responsible only for themselves. Such a line of behavior can only be welcomed, don't you agree? One should give oneself an account, first, of what your attitude to people is, and of the fact that people are born for each other, Marcus Aurelius teaches. Secondly, what people are like at the table, on the bed, etc., especially what power their foundations have over them, and with what conceit they do their work. Thirdly, in that if in a given case people act rightly, one should not be angry with them, but if wrongly, it is obviously against the will or through ignorance. For every soul against the will is deprived both of truth and of an attitude toward another person consistent with his dignity. For people very much dislike to be heard as unjust, ungrateful, greedy, and, in a word, misguided towards their neighbors. Fourthly, in that you yourself are in many ways deluded and like them. If you have not fallen into any delusion, you are no stranger to the inclinations that give rise to it. Fifth, in that you are not even sure whether they are deluded. After all, another soul is a dark place, and there's a lot to learn before you can speak confidently about someone else's actions. Sixth, that to indulge in excessive annoyance or indignation is to forget the transience of human life and the imminent death of all. Seventh, that it is not people's actions that are a burden to us. Their real source is in the leadership of these people, but our beliefs. Remove the beliefs, wish to be free from judging these actions as something terrible, and the anger will be gone. But how do we remove them? By reflecting on the fact that for you there is nothing shameful in these deeds. Eighth, in how the consequences of anger and distress about something are more burdensome than the thing that causes the anger and distress. Ninth, that benevolence, if it be sincere and not contrived, is something irresistible. What indeed will a licentious rapist do to you if you remain invariably benevolent to him and, when the occasion presents itself, meekly admonish him? And at the very moment when he is about to do you evil, you, keeping calm, address him. There is no need, my son. We were born for another. I will not suffer harm, but you will. Then it is necessary to show him that it is really so, and that neither bees nor animals born for herd life act in such a way. But this should be done without ridicule or mockery, but in a loving manner, without harboring resentment without adopting a teacherly tone, and without seeking to surprise those present, or in private, or if outsiders are present. Remember these nine rules, as if receiving them as a gift from the muses, and while you are still alive, finally become a human being. Reread the nine rules of the Stoic Emperor several times and say, where do you see selfishness here? But these rules represent the quintessence of Stoicism, its basic canon. The main principle of life of an egoist says, each for himself and only for his own benefit. 
a similar principle of the Stoic sounds differently. Everyone is responsible for himself and does not act only for his own benefit. As the ancient Romans said, sapienti sat. To the intelligent, enough is enough. As for the representation of death of close people within the framework of negative visualization, here the comparison of a surgeon with a murderer is justified. Both of them plunge knives into the human body, but what they have in common ends there. A surgeon performs an operation for the good of the patient, while a murderer cuts off a human life. Negative visualization is a kind of contingent surgery, a mental exercise that does good by helping us appreciate more strongly what we have. Imagining the death of his family members, the Stoic will pay more attention to them because he understands, recognizes, accepts with reason the transience of human existence. Roughly speaking, a Stoic will prefer to spend the weekend with his family instead of going fishing or working on the next report. He will try to please his loved ones now, not putting it off for tomorrow, because tomorrow everything may change. Well, perhaps you do not need to explain all the advantages of the practice of negative visualization. You have already learned them long ago. It is better to go to the antagonist of the Stoic, a Terry egoist, who thinks in the following way. I don't care about my relatives. If they all die tomorrow, it won't upset me at all. Agree that equating the egoist and the stoic is like likening a surgeon to a murderer or suspecting a procedural nurse of sadistic tendencies on the grounds that she regularly pokes living people with medical needles. On this positive note, we end this chapter. Dear friends, thank you for watching the video. I hope it was interesting. Please write your opinion and wishes in the comments. Subscribe to the channel. The continuation will be released in the next video. Peace, kindness, and love to you and your family.